a warm welcome to everyone who's joining the live edition of today's webcast. Or you might be watching the recording at one point. This is Anders Bunnett from Brussels. It's the 23rd of March at 12.30. I will be covering the notice of competition for two very exciting competitions launched by the European Personal Selection Office. One is for chemicals policy and the other one is for nuclear inspectors. And these are very unique, very special and quite uh, extraordinary competitions, not in terms of what the requirements are, because those are pretty classic, but for the kind of positions that they are selecting candidates for, because it's not every day that the EU would be looking for nuclear inspectors or those who are experts in chemical policy. So with that, let's get started. And uh, as always, let me ask you uh, where you're dialing in from. So while we do the sound check and all the technical check, please type into the chat box, where are you dialing in from? Where are you watching this webinar from? Whether it's uh, Brussels uh, or beyond in Europe or perhaps even further away, somewhere in the world. And we usually do our competition of where or who is dialing in from the furthest away from me in Brussels, Berlin, Dublin, all right. Montreal, Canada, okay, so far, you're probably the winner, uh, the, the dialing in, and, and it must be very early there, right? It's like 6.30 or 7.30 in the morning. I appreciate you getting up to watch this live recording. Mannheim, Brussels, Heidelberg, any other, Idar Oberstein, which I guess is in Germany, but I can't locate where exactly, Vienna, Italy, very diverse geographically and in every sense of the word. Appreciate you joining us. So with that, now that you are familiar with the chat box, I encourage you to put any question you may have into the chat box and please ask anything related to the competition. I might cover that topic a little later. I'll indicate that to you. And if not, I'll follow it up during the Q&A session or perhaps later in a different format. So with that, uh, I won't bore you with my background. You might know that I'm the author of the Ultimate EU Test Book and uh, a partner and founding partner of EU Training. In case you miss anything, we'll share the recording with you. And we will also share the presentation that I'm presenting right now. And we'll also provide a transcript in a couple of days as soon as we get to it so you can hear this information or rather read about this information if that's your preferred format. So with that, with all the housekeeping done, few words about EU training, you might be a long time customer or you might be new to our services and the platform. We have over 100,000 registered users. We've been in the EPSO preparation business for over 10 years and we have uh, lots of followers, fans on Facebook, which I encourage you you to join. And then we have a huge question database, over 25,000 questions and growing. So that's something we are constantly improving and adding to along with other services. And there have been millions and millions of questions used by candidates like yourself to prepare for competitions. You might also want to check out our webinars, which are there to provide a deep dive into certain topics and uh, that can include abstract verbal numerical reasoning tests that can include assessment center. We even have one webinar on math refresher, if that's your weak spot and certain others that are about career management and similar topics. We have lots of free webinars and uh, tens of thousands of people have watched those over the years. We even did a series exactly one years ago, one year ago, when the lockdown became a reality for most of our participants, candidates, clients, which you might want to check out. And if I can ask my colleagues to just paste the link there, it was a series of seven webinars which aim to help your EPSO preparation and general career management. So those were all free and that can be found on the website. And now regarding today's edition, at the end, we'll share with you a special discount code. And that's something that you can use for all of our online services. So please take advantage of that. Let's actually get into the main topic of today, which is uh, essentially the two competitions, the chemicals policy and the one for nuclear inspectors. 
the reason there's basically no real reason why we group these two together other than the fact that they were launched pretty much at the same time by EPSO and both are so-called specialist competitions but they are completely independent and if you actually have the profile you may as well apply for both now i don't know if you're a chemicals expert and a nuclear inspector if you do fit both of those profiles but again these are two completely separate competitions and anyone can apply for either or both as long as you meet the criteria where are you going to work is probably a fundamental question in your choice whether or not to apply for one competition or another basically for the chemicals policy competition the place of work is going to be brussels because when you are successful and you see how positive and optimistic i am i say when and not if so when you succeed and you're on the reserve list then you can be recruited hired by the european commission and more specifically they mentioned dg grow which is a dg for small and medium-sized enterprises and industry you can also be hired by dg energy so there are different places within the commission that might hire you and when it comes to the nuclear inspectors the place of work is luxembourg more specifically dg energy where you are likely to be placed so that's something to bear in mind. And uh, I'm actually not sure if we still have that article, but at one point, I think we do, which I, I wrote when, when I, I used to live in Luxembourg, comparing Brussels and Luxembourg in a semi-funny way. So where might you want to end up working? It's something like uh, Brussels versus Luxembourg. And I don't remember what the title was, but we can, we can look it up if uh, my colleagues are not too busy with the incoming questions and comments. Maybe they can uh, Google around for that. Application. So let's look at the application process and what it actually requires. The most basic core piece of information you want to know is how many places are there and on the reserve list. Just to make sure everyone is clear about the idea. The EPSO competitions are not about recruitment. They are about selection. So they will select suitable candidates and place them on a so-called reserve list. That's when your status becomes so-called laureate, which is no more candidate, but laureate. So sort of a winning candidate who is now recruitable. So at that point, when you're on the reserve list, you can be hired by the EU institutions. How many places are there on the reserve list? You can see on the screen and very clearly indicated in the notice of competition. 46, uh, sorry, 45 for the chemicals policy and for the nuclear inspectors, you have 40 places. So that's actually in proportionate terms, a very good number. Many competitions might have five, 10, 15 places. So this is actually a pretty good number. Also considering the fact that these are specialist competitions. So the chances are pretty good there probably aren't tens of thousands of candidates who meet the profile requirements. I'm pretty certain that's not going to be the number of candidates for these competitions. As a result, if you fit that profile, you stand a pretty good chance of succeeding. So the proportions are in your favor, given the number of places on the reserve list and given the uniqueness of the profile being sought. So with that, Let's take a look at a couple of other practical pieces of information. One is the application deadline. So for chemicals policy is the 13th of April, which is uh, in a couple of weeks. So make sure you don't leave your application to the last moment and that you fill out your profile, the questions and all the other necessary information on time. For nuclear inspectors is the 20th of April. So a week after the, the other one, Again, don't leave it to the last moment. If you're lucky enough to live in a country where you can travel around for the Easter holiday and your holiday uh, mood might make you forget some of these uh, necessary steps, make sure you do that on time and not in the last moment. Probably the most important question for all of these competitions is, are you eligible? Do you have the formal requirements? Do you meet the formal requirements? that are necessary for you to be eligible for the competition. So take this very seriously and do everything that in, is in your power to prove that you are eligible. 
obviously you want to be truthful you want to be ethical you want to make sure that you only say information that is accurate having said that you need to persuade to some degree the selection board members that you meet all those formal requirements that the competition prescribes there are general criteria that you need to meet and there are more unique more specific criteria you need to meet when it comes to the general criteria here is what you see on the screen you must be an eu citizen so one of the 27 member states passport is something you need to hold you need to be in good moral standing which is a little bit of a vague thing and i've never really looked into what that means in practice and i've never actually come across any candidate who was excluded from a competition for not meeting the character requirements that the job requires. Now, I would imagine, and again, it's just my speculation, I don't think there's any word on this in the notice of competition, but who knows, maybe for nuclear inspectors, some sort of security clearance might be required. So if you are visiting a nuclear power plant as an inspector of a public authority, that is the European Union, and more specifically the European Commission, well, you might need to have a certain clean track record or that sort of profile or background or, or need to have undergone certain checks in order to qualify for that sort of job. Again, this is my speculation. I don't think there's any word on that in the notice of competition, but perhaps the character requirements loosely translates into that sort of criteria. And then you need to have completed military service, which is only in, in, only in a couple of EU countries that is required and obligatory. Um, I think it's Greece, perhaps Austria, and there might be maybe Spain. Uh, but then again, the vast majority of EU countries do not require that. Uh, and I see here's a question, UK is out. Yes, UK is out. So UK, if you have a British passport and as the only passport you hold, you are no longer considered an EU citizen. So you need to have a passport citizenship of one of the EU's 27 member states. Next up, language rules. This is a very, very practical aspect of optimizing your chances to succeed. Now, what are the language rules? Language one can be any of the EU's 24 official languages. So that means you can choose any language regardless of the passport you hold. I'm Hungarian, I'm also Belgian for some years now. I could choose Finnish, well, if I spoke Finnish, or I could choose uh, Portuguese or Romanian or Greek. Unfortunately, I don't speak these languages, but I am free to choose English, for instance, if that's my preferred language one in which I want to take certain tests. Of course, most people would choose their mother tongue. Well, as long as it's one of the EU's 24 official languages. So if you grew up in a family that spoke Russian, well, you cannot choose that because it's not an official EU language. My point is that the passport you hold and the language you pick as language one have nothing to do with each other. You can truly choose any language that you master at the required level. What's really important is to bear in mind that the pre-selection tests, and something we'll look at, the pre-selection tests, which are the abstract verbal numerical reasoning tests, will be conducted in language one. So if you have the flexibility or the liberty to choose any language, then try to, well, any language, but you can choose from multiple languages because you speak two or three languages very well. In that case, choose a language in which you can passively process information the fastest. So if you can take in information, reading comprehension, your vocabulary is really good, pick a language that you master at least passively in that way. Now, when we come to language two, then it must be English or French. So I probably wouldn't choose English as language one because it has to be different from language two, which would leave me with French being my language two. Now, I speak French fluently, but I'm not as eloquent in French as I would be in English. And I, my written skills, definitely far away from my English written expression. So again, language two needs to be a language in which you can actively express yourself the best whether in spoken, whether in writing, make sure that it's something that you can really, really express yourself well. So given the fact that language two must be English or French, so there you don't have a lot of choice and it 
probably is English for most of you that you would pick. Well, language one then would probably be a language which is close to your mother tongue or in which you have conducted your education or followed your education. In. So that's pretty much it about the language. And as I said before, it has to be different. That's uh, pretty clear. And um, it's not that of a difficult of a choice. But then again, if you speak multiple languages, then you have sort of a first word problem or, or, or a good dilemma to have which one to pick. Qualifications. Now, qualifications, that's really important given the fact that this is a specialist competition. So let's look at the chemicals uh, policy competition first, where you need to have completed university studies of at least four years. So often this is not a bachelor degree may not be enough because most bachelor degrees are three years, whereas this, is, this requirement says you need to have completed four years. So that's slightly different. And it's not only any degree, obviously, but it has to be linked to the topic of the competition. So here's a big laundry list of the kind of degrees that you may have completed, which qualify you for the competition. I'm not going to read all of them out. You can see it on the screen from chemical engineering to pharmacology to veterinary medicine. So there are quite a lot out there. Or perhaps uh, for the sake of transcription, I will read it out so it gets into the written version of this webinar. So it's uh, chemistry, chemical engineering, mineralogy, mining, toxicology, ecotoxicology, biology, environmental studies, human or veterinary medicine, and pharmacology. Or buy a diploma in another subject relevant to the nature of the duties. So there you have a bit of flexibility because if you have a very unique degree, which may not be listed here, but it's entirely relevant to the nature of the duties that are described in the notes of competition, then you might qualify. And it's not, not enough to have only, well, only four years of degree, a formal qualification in those, in those areas, but you need to have additional three years of professional experience in the field of chemicals. And again, chemicals is a very broad area. You certainly know much better than I do with my legal background and expertise in communication and public affairs, what chemicals in a broader sense means. So again, from pharma to, to veterinary, to human health, to substances and, and, and everything in between these areas. So it's very, very broad. So chemicals, uh, I see here is one question I, I quickly caught. How broad is the field of chemicals, pharmaceuticals included? I'm pretty sure pharmaceuticals is included. So pharmaceutical is, is ultimately, it's chemicals, right? It's not just uh, uh, about toxicology and, and, and material science, but uh, pharmaceuticals would pretty surely uh, be covered. <clears throat> now, I guess it also matters if you spend three years in, in a pharma company and you were dealing with marketing, or payroll and human resources, that's probably different. But again, it has to be, the work experience has to be relevant to the nature of the duties being asked. Uh, here, Anka is asking me, material science is included. I would guess so. Again, if you really dealt with material science, well, that's, that's chemicals about, um, again, the, any materials, their, their, their chemical profile, their, uh, toxicology assessments um, and any sort of characteristics or, or developing uh, materials, uh, food contact materials, whatever it may be, I am 99% sure that would qualify you well for this competition. And then qualifications. Yes, materials are substances. Uh, qualifications. And this is also, this is basically a variation, right? So either four years degree three years professional experience or, or what you see on the screen, three years degree in the very same fields with a pretty generic reference of an, any other degree that's relevant to the job and four years of professional experience. So it's four plus three or three plus four. So hopefully that gives you a pretty clear answer whether your profile fits and you formally qualify for the competition. 
So let me pause for a second. I see there are a few questions coming in apart from the ones that I caught uh, from the corner of my eyes. So here's one. Does PhD qualify as a professional work experience? Now, I think we get this question a lot and it uh, it's a difficult one. If the PhD was paid and you actually did it as a, as a teaching assistant and you were employed full time and you can you can you can um, present it you can prove it with the right documentation which i presume you can because you did a formal phd at a university i would guess yes it qualifies you for this as a work experience now here's my legal disclaimer whatever i tell you is to the best of my knowledge but it's not the official source so make sure that if you have any doubt or you have any question, you ask the selection board or EPSO itself whether this is the case. So in this case, you have completed your education, which is which qualifies you for that part. And then you need the three years of experience and PhDs are probably never shorter than three years. They tend to be often much longer. But again, if you had a paid position relevant to the job because i presume your phd was perhaps full time and you had to teach and you had to be dealing with those areas on a daily basis while doing your research then by all chances this would qualify you now if your phd was part time <clears throat> and in the meantime you didn't work elsewhere or you had no pay paid em employment that might be more of a tricky situation so again, it depends whether it was full-time, part-time PhD or what, what is the exact context. But again, with whatever I described, I think you get the idea that it had to be a paid position, paid employment, relevant with relevant tasks and relevant topics that you dealt with. Other question, uh, the UK is out, but is English still an official language? Yes, it's still an official language. Uh, think of Ireland and it's not only Gaelic, but also uh, English, which is an official language. I believe uh, also in Malta, English is official language. So yes, English is still very much an official language. And practically speaking, more staff speaks English than any other language. Not necessarily as a, as a first language, but as the lingua franca, the, the language in which communication most often happens in the institutions. And one more thing, uh, can you please shed some light on the timing of the next steps, if possible? We'll, we'll get to it in a moment, but to give you a rough idea. So we had the deadline of application 13th and 20th of April. And then we'll look at in a moment at the talent screener and the different steps. So those take uh, a, a few within a few weeks, you need to fill out all those papers, papers, virtual papers, basically on screen questionnaires where you need to answer the questions in the talent screener and then we'll see when and how the so-called pre-selection tests might take place here's another one uh, for the nuclear inspectors right so we're no longer talking about the chemicals we're talking about the nuclear inspectors so here it's slightly different this is not an 86 level competition so administrator level six but it's an AST competition, so assistant level, AST3. Do not be misled by the word assistant. So assistant is not secretary, so it's not a clerical task. This is very much substantive and just on a different level. So the level of responsibility might be, might be, might be different. And you're maybe not so much dealing with policy making, but you're dealing with perhaps project management or on-site inspections or similar tasks. So what is required of you if this is your topic of interest? Well, the qualification you can see on the screen, and it's a post-secondary education with a diploma. Yeah, so it, it does not require a university degree anymore. It says post-secondary education, which is a broader category. It could be other technical qualifications by a recognized uh, education facility in a, in a technical field. So engineering, industrial engineering, electromechanics, or in the field of natural or applied sciences. So as you can see, nuclear physics, nuclear chemistry, radi radiation protection, radiobiology, physics, chemistry. So 
so again, uh, you may qualify for both competitions, as as I see and and explain these these areas. There could be overlap, but again, now we're only focusing on the nuclear inspector competition at this point. So what else is required? So you need to have some basic qualification, the post secondary degree, <clears throat> and or education plus a minimum of three years professional experience. So it's somewhat similar in, in, in terms of what's required. And out of those three years, two years must be actually related to specific, very specific areas, all of which is on the screen. Now, this time I'm really not gonna read it out, but for those doing the transcript, please put that into the written format. So everything is collected in a single space. So there are many, many other uh, sub criteria, but I think it gives you a fairly specific idea. Basic qualification, education plus work experience. And in this case, it has to be three years of which two years in a very concrete area. Voila. There is also a variation here, similarly to what we saw for the chemistry policy experts. So this one, it's secondary education, again, uh, though this one is, is actually the secondary education would be relevant to the field. So it's not post-secondary, but secondary, right? So if you went to a high school where you really, that, was, that has a specialty in these fields, then you might qualify as long as you have more work experience. So either you have post-secondary and three years, in this case, your very own secondary education may be highly relevant, but then you need six years of experience. Yeah. So again, with some caveats there that two years must be very focused on one concrete area of the competition. So I hope this is clear. Now, certainly there, there, there must be a lot of variations and many of you would have different backgrounds and professional background and history and, and, and uh, professional career paths, which may be somewhere in between or a bit of a gray zone that you went to this kind of high school or you had that kind of certification and maybe the years not add up. There's certainly a lot of, lot of um, variations there. So if you have a very specific question, you might put it into the chat box. I'll try to answer it to the best of my abilities. But if it's very, very unique, really, special to your to your background send us a message and we'll try to give you our best advice whether we think you qualify or what you might be able to do to provide information that you meet those criteria so let me uh, pause for a second i see there is a question about the nuclear inspectors competition and it says is is a master's degree or engineering degree can it be accepted for nuclear inspectors competition Probably yes, given all this description. So a master degree or, or engineering degree, I would think so, because that is definitely a post-secondary education. So the idea of post-secondary education is broader than just simply saying university degree. And university is post-secondary education, but post-secondary can mean some specialized courses that give you a formal certification, even outside university. So if you actually have a university master's degree, I very much think that that qualifies you for this competition, provided you have the, the, the relevant number of years of work experience. So you don't only need the education background, but you have the three years of work experience as well. Okay, with that, why is this a great opportunity? Probably I don't need to convince you that this is a great opportunity because you're already here. You're actively seeking information. You're trying to optimize your chances and you're doing everything you can to succeed in this competition. Yet for the sake of completeness, salary is very attractive. You can find out not exactly, but almost exactly how much you would likely earn. We have a salary calculator on the EU training.eu website. And that's something where you can just input all the data about your family background, where is your current, where do you live currently? So where you might be recruited from, because that impacts your allowances and the salary. 
and uh, configure all these the, the, this data points, and then it gives you your rough salary that you can expect, the net amount. Just to give you an idea, so for an 86, where if you're recruited from outside Belgium, because you're not living here yet, then it would be roughly around 5,500, 5,000, 5,500 euros net per month. And for ASD3, I think it would be roughly 3,000, 3,500. Roughly. And again, you can do more specific simulations using that calculator. And it's not just a salary, but there's a very good health insurance, which uh, you get uh, access to for you and your family. Family as in your, your partner or your spouse and children. And then there are the European schools that are offered for EU officials. So with that, how to get one of these jobs? Uh, let me pause for a second and, and see if there's any more question coming in. But I think maybe there's just one question I haven't answered yet, which is about the EU test book. And uh, for administrators, is it relevant for this competition? Yes, it's relevant for this competition. So the AD, the administrator edition of the ultimate EU test book is relevant for this competition. Well, for the nuclear inspectors, uh, sorry, for the chemicals policy. For nuclear inspectors, that's an ASD competition but it's a specialist competition. So they're probably actually also the administrator edition would be the relevant one, despite being an assistant competition, given the nature of tests required in this competition, even for the nuclear inspectors, I probably would suggest you look at the AD edition of my book. Okay, with that, how to get one of these books, uh, books, you see, books are on my mind, how to get one of these jobs. So let's look at it at the application process in a little more detail and look at which steps you need to take and how you can optimize your chances. So first you need to declare your eligibility. Pretty easy, you do it through the online form, you tick the right boxes, you make sure that you are fully eligible. Then you pick your languages, probably using some of those ideas I've shared with you if you have the liberty to choose from multiple languages. And then the application can be submitted in any of the 24 official languages. Again, you might choose your, so to say, main language or just simply write it in English if you're comfortable doing that. It doesn't really have any bearing on your application, but simply processing the information might be easier if you do that in English or in French. And I'm trying not to destroy my camera. Uh, let me readjust its position. Good. Then there is a unique thing called the talent screener. So talent screener, and it's something we'll cover in more depth in a moment, that needs to be filled out in either English or French. So let's look at this uh, interesting thing with the talent screener. And of course, with all those caveats, make sure you validate everything by, by deadline. But let's look at the talent screener more specifically. What it is, why does it matter, and what are the things you actually need to pay attention to where you fill it out to maximize your chances. But again, I saw that Yvonne is asking about the salary step when you are doing the salary simulation. I think that depends on, the, on your work experience. So there's some slight adjustment that they will make based on how many years of work experience you have at the moment of recruitment. So for simplicity, you might want to pick uh, maybe one or two salary step for your simulation, knowing that it might be a little higher depending on how many years of work experience you, you actually can prove. Talent screener. So talent screener is basically a questionnaire where you need to answer a set of questions, very relevant and unique to the competition you're applying for. So if it's chemicals policy, it's gonna be questions about your background and relation to that very area. If it's nuclear inspectors, then again, it will be unique and relevant to that area. So the talent screener is basically a, a way for the assessors, so the selection board, to decide whether or not you have the right profile that meet the criteria for a given competition. And it's not just in 
formal terms, but in more substantive terms. So they want to know that you've actually dealt with certain areas, certain aspects of that competition or of that specific policy area. What concretely you have done in those fields, you need to provide very specific and complete information kind of to prove your point, to persuade them that yes, I fully qualify because I have the right experience. So please award me scores that will help me pass to the next stage. Because of that, it's very important how you fill out the talent screener. It's very important that you provide not just general statements that yes, I have a lot of experience in chemical engineering, but you provide dates, you provide specific projects and descriptions of what you did in those projects, that you describe the kind of um, research you've conducted or the responsibilities you held if you worked in a lab or you worked in, a, in, a, in an industrial setting or you work at a university conducting research. So here are a few tips how you can, how you can actually do that. You probably want to answer yes to as many questions in the talent screener as you can while being fully truthful and honest and deeply rooted in truth. So obviously never distort information. You never make up information. But if you did something, uh, let's say uh, conducted a research, <clears throat> you can present that in a way that will demonstrate that you have a certain experience. Or if you were assigned a project in a research facility or in a, in a, in a commercial company's uh, R&D department, you want to emphasize those aspects so you can demonstrate a given experience. And then you probably want to provide lots of information. So be very careful. One of the, the key mistakes that I've seen over the years candidates make is that they're just too vague in their statements. They're not concrete, not specific enough. And we'll talk about it in a moment, but they don't necessarily present that information in an easily scannable and, and digestible way. So make sure that you're very concrete, very specific, almost, almost as a lawyer proving their case in court. So think about how can I, what are the facts? What are, what is, what are my proof points that I can provide for the assessors to see my argument. An argument being, I qualify, I am, I have that experience you are looking for. And then to that, to that, uh, to that point, when you include figures and numbers and dates and uh, budgets or people you worked with or the, the scale of, a, of, a, of an experiment or the kind of samples you worked with or, or how many countries were involved or project partners, try to provide those details. Again, reinforcing your point about the seriousness of the work that you've conducted. When certain questions may resemble to previous ones you answered in the talent screener, still, I encourage you not to just copy paste your answers, even if broadly speaking, your answers are pretty much the same or would be the same as in previous answers. So try to customize it, try to maybe highlight different aspects to prove your point, which is relevant to that given question. Formatting is actually important. Uh, you may not think intuitively that, yeah, I, I need to provide a nice layout. Break that text into, into multiple paragraphs. Break, break those paragraphs into multiple bullet points. Make sure that it's easy to review, to overview, to scan the information and it the, the, the data and the message you are trying to convey, it's not buried in those paragraphs. Candidates with brilliant backgrounds and PhDs and very, very strong, solid academic background sometimes actually do this rookie mistake. So you want to make sure that when the person, and it's always a person who's going to be reading the talent screener, they look at it it's very, very clear to them the kind of information you want to highlight. So they can award you the highest possible score, which is usually three points per question. And because they just see that uh, you've proven your point in your answers. So with that, 
think a little bit what's in it for them. They are ultimately working for EU institutions, they meaning the assessors, and they want to see candidates who will one day might be their colleagues. So think how a certain experience or a certain publication that you contributed to or, or any moment in your career, how can that actually be helpful, useful for the EU institutions when you work as a member of their team? So a little bit, uh, call it a sales mindset, but saying, okay, my experience conducting research in this and this area seems very relevant for the plastic strategy that the EU is currently engaged in. So you might want to bring, kind of sneak in some sentences like that. This is not a motivational letter. This is not a cover letter for a specific job application, but still to a limited extent, you want to think with their head and say, when they read this, say, oh, whatever this person has done in marine wildlife research, uh, material science research, uh, uh, I don't know, reduction of harm from, from, from radiation, whatever the topic is, you still want to think a little bit, how does that relate to what the EU is trying to do in those areas? And then, uh, EU institutions as well, they tend to be rather formalistic, so you might want to use some jargon or some keywords which are more commonly used in EU circles and perhaps not at the workplace or research facility or company where you had your work experience. So you probably want to look at the websites of those directorates general of the European Commission, look at a couple of press releases that they put out there or some speeches by a commissioner or just some policy documents or annual reports and get a little familiar with the language, the kind of terminology that they are using that you might want to also use in your talent screen or replies. And actually, we have a dedicated webinar on the Talent Screener. It's called Everything You Need to Know About Episodes Talent Screener. Very tabloid style title. I take full responsibility for that, but hopefully it gives, gives you even more practical ideas. And I walk you through a couple of uh, examples of what to do, what not to do, what works and what doesn't. And you might want to check that out to optimize your chances. <clears throat> Now let's talk a little bit about the pre-selection tests, the so-called uh, CBT exams or computer-based tests, which are the abstract verbal numerical reasoning tests, which many of you are probably familiar with. And the interesting thing in the specialist competitions, so both for chemicals and for the nuclear inspectors, is that these computer-based tests may be part of a pre-selection if there are a lot of candidates. So if there are a lot of candidates and usually, I don't know exactly, it's something like five, 10, maybe 10 times more than places on the reserve list. They see, ooh, it's super popular, this competition. They will use these computer-based tests to pre-select candidates who can go on to the next stage. Now, if there aren't that many candidates, they will use these tests as part of the assessment center. So what is the bottom line? You need to take these computer-based tests. You need to do abstract verbal numerical reasoning, but the scores will be different. And as I just said, you might do it sort of early in the process because then it's a selection test, which is eliminatory, or you need to do it as part of the assessment center later on. And then the scores are much more accessible. So you don't necessarily need to compete against other candidates. You just need to reach a minimum score and you're good. So it, this is how the, the uncertainty of how many candidates are actually going to apply. This is, uh, this is EPSO's tool to mitigate that risk. So I see that there are a couple of questions about a talent screener. So let me pause here for a second before I look at the abstract verbal numerical. So let's see, <clears throat> talent screener must be in your language two choice, yes, yeah? so English or French. And can I write the talent screener in English if my first language is English? Yes, because, uh, or actually let me pause for a second, because talent screener is English or French, 
and it has well so I, as i understand correctly your language one would be english which means your language two would be french and you're asking whether you can write the talent screener in english still but i think uh, the talent screener has to be in language two so probably it cannot be in english in your case so for that you would need to pick english as language two in order to write the talent screener in english or reply or what is it fill out the talent screener in english i probably want to double check that but chances are it has to be the language two and cannot be just english or french independent of what your language two is okay next one uh, are your chances better if you fill it in english rather than french mm. I don't think so. I don't think that matters whether it's English or French. So it's 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 mainly what you write and how you write, not necessarily in which language you write. Next one, talent screener questions are quite vague. Is there any more information on the criteria somewhere? I mean, what exactly are they looking for? So, <coughs> excuse me. Yes, they're vague and broad. And that is why I spent quite a bit of time now detailing the kind of techniques you want to apply that you despite being the question being vague, you want to be very concrete in listing your achievements, your track record, and those proof points. So it's not really a relevant thing to say you that there are criteria that they're actually looking for. It's That's why there's a bit of subjectivity built in, for better or worse, because if you provide very comprehensive information in the right format using the the right way of presenting that information then the the assessor will look at it and say hmm based on what i've read from zero to three points i'm going to give two or i'm going to give three or i'm going to give one they're not going to tick boxes and say oh does this has this person done uh, whatever uh, work experience in a in a in a in a nuclear power uh, factory or, 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 or a plant for six months because I'm going to give an extra point for that sort of experience. It would be impossible given the diversity of experience that candidates have and really the variations, it wouldn't be possible. That is why while the question is open, your answer needs to be very specific. Okay, how long does it take from the submission of the application form until the moment where the CBTs are starting? So that depends on whether the computer-based tests are part of the pre-selection, in which case it probably would take around six to eight weeks. So around a month and a half, two months from the moment of the application deadline. And again, just a rough estimate. If the computer-based tests are part of the assessment center, then obviously that will happen later. So there you have more time to brush up on your abstract verbal and numerical reasoning skills. Okay, I see that there are some other questions. I'll try to come back to those uh, in a moment, but let me just cover the core topics that I wanted to cover. Verbal reasoning, I would presume many of you are familiar with that. You can find a lot of uh, sample questions on EPSO's website, on our own website. We are proud to offer you verbal reasoning in 19 languages. So chances are your language one will be covered and we're still adding more languages as we speak. So those tests are available and it's a reasoning test. It's not about language comprehension. It's more about logic and thinking using words. Numerical reasoning is, well, data calculation. The timing is what you see on the screen. You have 10 questions and 20 minutes. And the challenge is often not that the questions are difficult, rather than they are hard to answer within that set time frame. So timing is the difficult part, and that is why you probably want to practice quite a bit to make sure you perform very effectively, very efficiently under that time pressure. And then same goes for abstract reasoning, where you actually have even less time, 10 questions in 10 minutes, and quickly find the logic of how certain patterns move around on the screen. And then the scoring is what you see on the screen. So the verbal reasoning is set apart. So that has a higher pass mark as in 10 out of 20, whereas the numerical and the abstract are combined and you need to pass as a combined score. So if you're totally not 
able to answer any question correctly for the numerical reasoning, but you answer all questions correctly for the abstract reasoning, you can still pass. Now, you don't want to risk that. You want to do your best shot, but given the way the scoring goes, you can afford to lose a bit more points for the numerical or the, or the abstract than it is the case for verbal. And the pass mark often is not enough. So that's why it depends on whether the computer-based tests are pre-selection or part of the assessment center. If they are part of pre-selection, then there's a true competition, meaning you your score is compared to other candidates. So you need to not only pass, but pass with a good grade or with a good score. Talent screener review. So that's when a talent screener review comes. If the computer-based tests were pre-selection. If they were not pre-selection, they actually do the talent screener preview at that point, and only after comes the abstract verbal numering as part, numerical as part of the assessment center. So that is where the true difference lies. What does the assessment center look like? Well, these days, it's an online series of tests. Now, it used to be an in-person thing, not far away from our office where you would go there to uh, to the to the EPSO HQ and you need to undergo certain tests but in this case you actually have pretty much everything online it might change who knows what the situation is with COVID by the time you get to the assessment center for these competitions but chances are it will be conducted online we actually have our beautiful studio available if you want to have a silent, secure, strong internet connected place with good lighting that I'm benefiting from and with a nice microphone. So you can do that actually in, in a rented space, but you can do it from home. You can do it from anywhere as long as it's conducted online and you meet the basic IT and security criteria. It's done in language too, right? So it's English or French. For chemicals policy, here's what you have. You have a case study exam. So that's based on a background documentation, background files that you need to draft, usually some sort of a summary or a briefing or a similar note. Then there is the SCBI, so the situational competency-based interview, which is somewhat new and replaced the group exercise. Then you have the competency-based interview where they ask questions about your resilience, your communication skills, your working with others, or your ability to prioritize and organize. You have an interview in the field. So that is the most concrete link to the field of the competition and your professional background and the written test in the field. So that's where they really test your knowledge of the field. And the way they score, pretty straightforward. You need to have certain minimum points for the general competencies, and you need to score well for those two tests that are truly linked to the professional area of the competition. When all goes well, you get on the reserve list. Very similar concept for nuclear inspectors with slight modifications. So you actually have a case study exam very similar again, the situational competency-based interview, the SCBI, you have the CBI, so the competency-based interview, and then you have the interview in the field. So there's no more written test in the field, just, and I'm using air quotes, just an interview in the field. So relatively similar. And then again, the, the pass mark is slightly different because you no longer have a competency that nuclear inspect that uh, chemicals policy experts had, which is leadership. Given the fact that it's an AD, so administrator level position, where one of the competencies EPSO requires is leadership. But the fact that nuclear inspectors, it's an AST, so assistant level exam, there is no more leadership as a competency being tested. Hence, 70 points and not 80 points. But then again, you have the field related interview, which also needs to have a minimum point, at least uh, 50 out of 100. And of course, there's a ranking compared to other candidates, so you need to perform well to get on the reserve list. So that's pretty much it. And I know that there are quite a few uh, questions are coming in. So just to finish off, once you're on the reserve list, 
uh, you're listed there, the reserve list usually is valid for one year, but for specialist competitions like this one, it's probably going to be valid longer because they want to make sure that they hire as many laureates from the reserve list as they can, provided most of you who are on the reserve list are still interested and available to take up a job with the European Commission. So how to get the job and how to prepare for all of this? Couple of ideas, lots of practice, depending on where you are in your performance metrics right now. Prepare maybe for an hour per day or 30 minutes every day or, or 50 minutes every, every day or one hour every second day. Whatever it is, have some sort of a preparation plan, a bit like the way you probably would prepare for some sports competition or academic competition with a plan and regular practice. There is test methodology, and we're also testing whether you are really paying attention that there is uh, e-missing. So that's testing your accuracy level already at this point. So learn test methodology. There are tips and tricks and shortcuts and ways to save time, to increase accuracy, to improve your performance at the test. We have tons of e-books, webinars, one-on-one -on -one training, group training, virtual training. We offer you all these services to help you make the most of it. Being persistent, so not giving up, staying or staying on, staying focused, doing lots of simulations. So we hopefully offer you everything that you need at EU training and the team is amazing. The products, we are constantly improving and making sure that they correspond to the candidates' needs. So check it out. And actually, I was even wrong. I forgot to, to say that now we have language number 20, which I don't even remember which language we added. I'll ask my colleagues to put it into the chat box that uh, marks this, uh, this milestone that we have now 20 questions available for uh, 20 languages available for verbal reasoning. And then for numerical and abstract languages, less of an issue. So those are available in fewer languages, but we have hundreds, if not thousands of tests available. And the webinars, many are free, many are paid. So those you can take advantage of, lots of tips and tricks articles, all of that is available online. So with that, I'll leave on the screen, not just the, the different uh, preparation tools, but the promised discount offer while I answer a few questions that have come in. So Veronica, kind enough to flag question number six, is the salary adjusted in accordance to the work experience and the education background? There are not huge variations there. So only minimal adjustments are being made because they in advance tell you that the chemicals policy is 86 and the nuclear inspector is AST3. So that gives you a very small bracket where they can do some minor adjustments for your salary, depending on how many years of work experience you have, or even if you have three PhDs, it's not going to make any major difference. We're talking about a, maybe a couple hundred euros of adjustment based on your background. But the bracket is pretty fixed and it's communicated to you upfront through this position, through the, 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 the levels at which you will be hired. Next one, uh, based on your experience, uh, only applicants who respond yes to all questions make it to the next round? Absolutely not. So do not be afraid if you need to answer no to some questions in the talent screener. That's okay because just you simply may not have that experience. You simply may not have done that sort of activity that they re request or they ask you about. It's okay. So as long as the proportions are okay, it's not like you answer no to 12 questions out of 15, that can be tricky. But if you have a few questions where you just need to answer no because that's the truth, that's okay. Now, trying to be then very convincing for the other questions where you could answer yes. What else? Um, the way of presenting things in the talent screener depends also on the number of experience to be stated. How should we tackle this problem? Uh, well, just because you had maybe six months experience working at um, a research facility, well, it could be a one line thing, but it could be a very detailed thing. You can say, I worked on this project and the project included the following areas. Here, here are the specific things I did. Here's the budget I handled. Here's the, the, the kind of research we did. Um, 
but here's the kind of materials I work with, the machines I'm able to operate, or the kind of uh, lab equipment I am familiar with, the kind of software which helps my research, here is what I can handle. You can provide a lot of details, even if the experience seems just a one-liner. Again, to prove, to show the kind of knowledge you've gained as part of that experience. And I know our time is almost up, so I'll, I'll try to be efficient and finish off most of the questions. Um, what is the difference between the nature of your work and your specific role and responsibilities? Can you provide examples to understand? Yeah, time is a little short for me to, to quickly come up with, with concrete examples. But the nature of your work, I think, is just a broad bracket, a broad category to say it was research work, it was helping uh, regulatory affairs with uh, safety assessments, I was helping um, maybe compliance with the legal department that the products we, the company uh, fabricated were, were, were compliant. So that's the nature of the work. But the, 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 the responsibilities and the specific role is I was a research assistant, I was an inspector, I was um, whatever you were, and then more details of actually what your daily work entailed. So you see, you go from the very high level to the more nuanced and more specific and more detailed description. Okay, uh, what else have I not tackled? Here's one, words characters uh, for our answers are restricted in the talent screener. Yeah, uh, on some of the questions, there are multiple experience to share, do you just uh, then select one? <sighs> yeah, um, as far as I'm aware, I mean, it's not that restricted. So usually there's a 3000 letter character count limitation, maybe it's less. So I don't think you, it's not a tweet. So it's not like you can only put there one thing you just make good judgment of what makes the most sense for that given question. And perhaps you provide a little fewer details, but you focus on the essence. But then again, be mindful of the visual layout, use bullet points, segment the text in the right way. And you don't necessarily need long sentences. You don't need to describe everything with full words and details. You can be to the point, a bit of a telegram style, perhaps a little bit you would in the CV or resume for those who prefer that term. Very to the point, key facts, dates, numbers, figures, and description. And that saves you space as well. Okay, if you're still with me and uh, are interested in maybe one or two questions I'll answer, any estimate of which threshold candidates would, would, uh, would need to keep the CBT as a first step rather than part of the AC? So the question is, what would be the score you need to reach in order to qualify to the next stage? Hard to tell, but usually if you perform around 70, 75% for, for these kind of competitions, that would be sufficient. So meaning that if you, the, the maximum point is 20, then if you get say 15, you have a very good chance of succeeding or passing on to the next stage. Again, as a rule of thumb. How is a written test in the field structured? How can you prepare for it? Well, I would say uh, that's that's that that's a long one, and it's hard to to give a very brief answer for that. But the, the written test in the field is more knowledge based and not competency based. So it's what you know, and not necessarily the the meta skills around how you process information, how you communicate, how you analyze data. So written uh, test of the field, maybe if, if you had to write a briefing on one specific topic, what would it be? Uh, and then again, more concrete to the subject matter area of the competition. Hard for me to say anything more meaningful in such a short time, but uh, perhaps uh, we could follow up this question. And then when is the new edition of the test book coming? Well, we only have a new edition for the assessment center this year, so there's no 2021 edition of the Ultimate EU Testbook Administrators or Assistants. So if you're interested in buying those, then buy the 2020 edition. We probably will do a new edition next year, but not this year. This year it's only for the assessment center. And the last but not least was the procedure to purchase an exercise book. Well, if it's the test book, you can go to the testbook website, eutestbook.eu, I believe, or .com. I don't even know the website of my own book, but I think it's .com actually with a dash eutestbook.com 
And then for EU training, you browse around the website and hopefully you will find your way around it. So with that, thank you so much for staying with me. I think I have covered all the questions that were asked, unless uh, I totally missed something. But as I said, if you have any follow-up questions, you get stuck somewhere, send a message to our team and uh, we will be very happy to answer those for you. Obviously, completely free of charge through the contact form and uh, share the resources that uh, we make available with fellow candidates and colleagues who you think are interested in these. And please let us know if we can be helpful in any way. We try to provide you the best tools and preparation resources on the market. So help us help us help you and we'll do our best to live up to your expectations. So with that, a big thank you to all of you for staying here. Thanks to Lenke and Veronica for helping me run this webinar so smoothly. And I also have here Esther who made it possible and uh, please stay tuned for, for new webinars and resources that we put out there. And as I said, if you have questions, just uh, get back in touch. So with that, thanks very much. And to be continued, and good luck for the competition. I wish you lots of success. Bye.